It's E minus 27 days, less than a month before polls open across the country. So far, we have heard a lot about which party is best position, positioned rather, to make life more affordable for Canadians. The Liberals and Conservatives are both promising major tax cuts. So how do they stack up? A Conservative government would cut the tax rate on taxable income under $47,000, sorry, $47,630, uh, to 13.75% from 15%. The cut would be phased in over several years, though. A Liberal government would raise the basic personal income tax deduction from $12,000 to $15,000 for people earning under $147,000. And that would also be phased in over seven, several years. So which puts more money, as they claim, in your pocket? Trevor Toome is an associate professor of economics at the University of Calgary and a research fellow at the School of Public Policy. He joins us from Calgary. Hi, Professor Toome. Great to see you. Hi, thanks for having me. Let's start off with the conservative proposal. What's your evaluation of that one? So as you noted, this lowers the tax rate on the first bracket. So as you earn more within that bracket, you save more dollars in your income taxes and the maximum benefit occurs to you once you reach the top of that bracket and beyond. And so that's worth maybe about a little over $400 for an individual. Um, and if you have two earners within a family, it can get over $800. And overall, that's about $5.9 billion in, in terms of the aggregate total value of the tax cut, which is quite similar in total uh, right. to the Liberal plan. And in layman's terms, that means that's how much revenue essentially they f they uh, is foregone by less money in federal coffers. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, on to the, the Liberals plan. What's your evaluation of that one? So it's roughly the same size. So they cost it at $5.6 billion, although we don't yet have the PBO estimates around that. I anticipate it would be somewhere in that range. So by increasing the basic personal amount that they propose, to 15,000 uh, by 2023, that means that more of your income would be tax-free. So you'd have to earn above 15 before you start paying any tax at all. And so that means the value of the tax cut accrues more quickly uh, to lower income individuals. And so the liberal tax reduction is more progressive in that sense than the conservative one. So when you're stacking the two up together and you're, let's say, you know, quote unquote, ordinary Canadian that they like, that, that's the, the terminology that, that every party likes to use quite a bit. But let's say I'm, uh, you know, earning a, a middle class income. Uh, who, who, which one benefits me more or is it kind of even? Well, the, the tax code, of course, is remarkably complex. And so each of these changes is going to affect different families in different ways. But roughly speaking, on average, the the biggest beneficiaries of the liberal tax change will be families earning between forty to eighty thousand dollars or so. And then the largest beneficiaries for the conservative plan will be among families earning between eighty and a hundred thousand uh, per year. So they're, they're, they line up pretty closely there. What I think is interesting about the liberal plan is your basic personal amount is not just yours. If you have a spouse who's not working, you can claim theirs. Or if you're a single parent, you can also claim your child. Uh, and so you get a much larger amount of income, up to $30,000 before taxes kick in. So for, for lower income families, I think the Liberal plan is um, clearly worth a lot more. How do you evaluate the overall effectiveness of the idea of a tax cut as promised in an election campaign? The idea behind it is the central message we've heard from all parties, make your life a little bit easier, uh, make it a little bit more affordable. Does something like this, and in regardless of the party, but both of them are proposing something somewhat similar, does that actually do that? So it, it does increase disposable incomes. Um, it increases it by a modest amount, depending on where you are in that income distribution, maybe around 0.5, 0.6% for most families. And, you know, that's not nothing. It's uh, five to $600 or so per family on average. And, and that can be used for a wide variety of things. So I think it, it can have a real effect, although I wouldn't want to overstate the implications of it for any given individual family. What about uh, the the amount of money it costs federal coffers, and that's something we've already we've already talked about. But around, right. let's say, around six billion dollars. If you're talking in the scheme of an overall budget, and I know this is in isolation, there's obviously going to be a host of other things that come across and come through. But how big of a chunk of change is that? So six billion by 2023, let's say, for both of the both of the proposals, we should compare that to the roughly. $400 billion in federal spending that we anticipate that year. So even the Conservatives, we add up all the other tax credits that they have proposed. So far in the campaign, we've got about $9.3 billion per year in revenue reductions to the federal government. 
to balance within five years, they would only have to grow spending at about 2% per year between now and 2023, compared to what was laid out in budget 2019 with growth of around 3% per year. So I think the total aggregate amount um, is manageable within the context of the full budget. Although, of course, there are trade-offs like there is with any policy choice we make. There sure are. All right, thank you so much, Professor Toom. Really appreciate your time and your insight this evening. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.